1460, King James II of Scotland lay siege to Roxburgh Castle. James had become king at just six years of age, and by then England and Scotland had been battling off and on for more than 170 years with invasions and raids, mostly over the control of Scotland itself. But in 1460, James had reason to be optimistic. He consolidated his own power in the kingdom, and he was now laying siege to one of the last remaining English castles held in Scotland. And to help prosecute that siege, he had a large collection of the most powerful and modern weapons then known, bombards. But the rule of James II was also illustrative of the instability and setbacks that faced the Scottish kingdom in the years prior to the unification of the crowns in 1603. And James's death was perhaps the greatest example of that instability, as well as of the nature of the most powerful and modern weapons then known. It is history that deserves to be remembered. Scottish King James I was captured by the English just before the death of his father, making him the uncrowned King of Scotland in 1406. He spent 18 years as a hostage before he was released. When he was finally allowed to return to Scotland, he was married to English noblewoman Joan Beaufort, a marriage that was meant to tie Scotland closer to England and push them further from France. In 1430, the royal couple had their first children, twins Alexander and James. Alexander was the elder, but died before his first birthday, leaving James as the heir to the throne. James was born with a large vermilion birthmark on his face, which led to the nickname Fiery Face. Scotland had struggled against England since at least 1296, when the English invaded in the First War of Scottish Independence. Internal conflict with disinherited Scottish nobles led directly to a second war in 1332, but despite setbacks, Scotland emerged independent at the conclusion of the wars, but hardly secure. James I was involved with his own internal disputes and had a number of his lords executed. After failing in 1436 to seize Roxburgh Castle, his uncle attempted a coup. The king was assassinated, but Joan, injured, was able to escape and reach six-year-old James II, who was crowned King of Scotland in March 1437. During his minority, Scotland was essentially ruled by various lords who fought for their own positions. James would spend the first years of his reign trying to consolidate his own control of the kingdom. He reached adulthood in 1439 and married Mary of Gelders, daughter of the Duke of Gelders, and great-niece of Philip the Good, Duke of Burgundy and Count of Flanders. This was an important marriage for the Scots specifically because of Flanders' access to bombards and other cannons. Guns had become an integral part of European combat and by 1400 were used in nearly every engagement. Gunpowder originated in China and likely made its way to Europe through Middle Eastern sources. Around 1267, Roger Bacon hinted at the recipe for gunpowder, writing that saltpeter, charcoal, and sulfur, one can make thunder and lightning if you know the means. Written recipes slightly later are attributed to Mark the Greek in the Book of Fires. James's father, in his failed siege of Roxburgh Castle in 1436, had acquired a large artillery train that he hoped to use to force the castle to surrender. Roxburgh had been the center of conflict between England and Scotland for centuries. The castle first appears in records in 1128 and is thought to have been built by Scottish King David I. It was surrendered to the English in 1174. The two kingdoms battled over the castle repeatedly in the years that followed. In 1314, it was captured by the Scots in a night attack. King Robert the Bruce ordered the castle demolished, lest the English should ever again rule the land by holding the castles. Nevertheless, another castle was built, and it traded hands several more times. In 1436, the French and English were engaged in the later stages of the Hundred Years' War. Joan of Arc had led successful French resurgence in 1429. Scotland attacked Roxburgh to assist the French by distracting England at home. One of the guns of the siege was likely the Lion, a brass bombard sent to Scotland from Flanders. According to chronicler Walter Bower, the Lion bore the inscription, For the illustrious James, worthy Prince of the Scots, magnificent king, when I sound off, I reduce castles. I was made at his order, therefore I am called Lion. Unfortunately, the siege was broken when a relieving English army arrived and much of the artillery was likely captured. James II was an ardent supporter of artillery, which was altering the face of European combat. Sieges that used to take months or years could be completed in weeks or even days with bombards, which launched enormous stones and smashed medieval defenses to pieces. Additionally, cannons and smaller guns fundamentally altered combat among infantry as well. Lords, who tended to be much better armored than levies and archers, were suddenly in much greater danger. They were less likely to survive to be captured and ransomed when men could be killed from a distance by gunpowder-powered missiles. 
Simultaneously, castles and defenses had integrated guns into their defenses. Roxborough had installed cannons by at least 1384. Roxborough was an important site. It was one of only a handful of locations that remained in English hands after the Scottish Wars for Independence. Along with Carlisle and Berwick-upon-Tweed was one of only three defenses permanently garrisoned at the Scottish border. In 1410, Roxborough had four functional cannons for defense. In 1455, England faced its own dynastic crisis with the opening salvos of the English civil wars known as the War of the Roses. 1455 also saw the end of war in Scotland when James defeated the Black Douglases for control of the kingdom. Strife in England offered opportunity to Scotland, and James led a number of campaigns against Northumberland and twice against the English castle at Berwick. He also had aims at taking Orkney, Shetland, and the Isle of Man, all of which came to nothing. He was known generally as a popular king, but he had a reputation as a hothead, which went along with the nickname Fireface. In 1452, he stabbed the Earl of Douglas... 26 times for conspiring with several other earls, and one of the king's men struck out the earl's brains with a poleaxe. The earl's body was then tossed out the window. He also declared in 1457 that his subjects should practice archery regularly and that football and golf be utterly cried down and not used. In 1548, the Scottish Parliament issued an act commanding the king to alter his behavior, but he wouldn't live long enough to alter his behavior much. James was highly interested in building up an armory of bombards and used them to some success in his struggles with the Douglases. In 1457, he received Mons Meg, an enormous bombard built by the Duke of Burgundy's artillery maker. Originally built in 1449, but didn't make its way to Scotland until eight years later when it was gifted as a sign of support. The cannon is 20 inches in diameter. Its barrel is more than nine feet long and weighs about seven and a half tons. It was among the largest bombards ever built, which made it difficult to move. Large crews and oxen could only pull the thing a few miles a day. The weaknesses was made up for by its power. The bombard launched 386-pound cannonballs. By 1460, James had decided to again attempt to recover an English possession, this time planning to besiege Roxborough, which had ended so badly for his father more than 20 years earlier. He also seems to have thrown his support in the war behind the Lancasters against the Yorkists, which had been allied with the Douglases. The town of Roxborough was easily captured, but the garrison refused to surrender, necessitating a siege. According to the 1849 book Historical Tales of the Wars of Scotland by John Parker Lawson, the king greeted reinforcements led by the Earl of Huntley and invited the Earl to witness the power of the great siege weapons. In cautiously approaching one of these pieces, it suddenly burst. A splinter struck the king on the thigh and otherwise severely wounded him. The king, not yet 30 years old, quickly bled out. Chronicler Robert Lindsay, writing in the 16th century, agrees with this version, saying that James was more curious than became him, did stand near the gunners when the artillery was discharged, that he was killed by the misframed gun when it exploded. The date was August 3rd, 1460, and James III was declared king at only eight or nine years of age. Opportunity for Scotland seemed to have ended, but Mary of Gilders rallied the men, and within a few days the Scottish forces had captured the English garrison. Mary ordered the castle destroyed, and only the remains of the once great edifice remain today. Only a month earlier, the Lancasters had been dealt a serious blow when Henry VI was captured after the Battle of Northampton. Ruling in the name of her young son, Gilders sheltered Henry VI's wife, Margaret of Anjou, who continued to agitate for her husband against the House of York. James II of Scotland was only 29 years old when he died. His rule was not without its successes. He founded the University of Glasgow, and he made certainly forms to Scottish law that are generally well regarded, but the opportunity that was offered to Scotland with the War of the Roses was largely lost. With his death, and the Scottish crown faced another long minority that was plagued by lords and other nobles who were most interested in securing their own power. Scotland continued to face the death of its monarchs and long minorities. James IV, like his father, grandfather, and great-grandfather, inherited the kingdom before he was 18. James V was only 17 months old when he was crowned, and his daughter Mary, Queen of Scots, was only six days old when she became queen. And even her son, James VI, who would become also James I of England, became King of Scotland at only 13 months old. In fighting among the regions and lords and powers in Scotland kept the kingdom looking inward for most of the century following the untimely death of James II at the hands of his own cannon. And we are simply left to wonder how things might have been different had that cannon not exploded.
I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy. Check out our community on thehistoryguyguild.locals.com, our webpage at thehistoryguy.com, and our merchandise at teespring.com, or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you have to do is subscribe.